to talk today about a relationship that's actually very important to each of us in our lives, but that we don't spend much time thinking about, and that's our relationship to our government. So I'm not talking about the sexy politics stuff. I'm talking about all that stuff that goes on inside the agencies and the jurisdictions that collect and spend our taxes for us, sort of boring stuff. So why do I want to talk about government? Well, because uh, about a year and a half ago, I started an organization called Code for America. And because there's a lot of students here tonight, I thought I'd just ask if anybody has heard of it before today. That's great. I'm hoping to get the word out. Um, so if you haven't heard of us, basically we're like a Teach for America or a Peace Corps, but for geeks. Uh, we're trying to bring the startup world, the approaches from technology startups into government to make government better. So what do we actually do? Um, we recruit cities through an open call for participation. We ask people in cities to tell us what they think a team of geeks could do for their city that would make it more open, more engaged with citizens, more transparent, more efficient, and something that could be reused by other cities later. So these are the first cities we are working with this year. We're very happy to have them. And then we recruit our fellows. Um, we had 362 applications for our first fellowship, it's 20 slots. These are our first fellows. I think these guys are the superheroes, I really do. They take a year off, they're essentially volunteering to make their uh, government work better. Um, about two thirds of them are developers. Um, the other ones are product managers, designers, we've got researchers, we have a journalist. So they're really trying to replicate sort of um, startup tech teams. Um, and by the way, we are recruiting currently for our 2012 fellowship, if anyone is interested. Um, so what do we do with these fel fellows in these cities? Well, we basically put them together for a year through a very structured program. We ask them to work on these projects that they've identified. Um, and we're really looking for them to just learn from each other and learn what our process should be. So um, we're only four months into it with our fellows, but I've been working on it for about a year and a half. And so I thought I'd just tell you some of the things that I feel like I've learned from working in government, having come from the tech media world of 15 years. First thing that I um, have learned is that government really needs to stop reinventing the wheel. Um, I'm gonna tell you a story about a $40 million procurement. There's a guy named Sumit Agarwal who is now in the Department of Defense. He reached out to us because he was in a meeting about getting veterans jobs. This is a really big problem, and there's a lot of solutions to it, but none of them seem to really work. And the solution that the uh, DOD came up with is that we need a new giant database that will house all the jobs and we can send all the veterans there. And he said it was basically like this, being in this meeting where you're, you're ha it's like you're having a meeting where you're talking about how to get soldiers from New York to DC, and you're talking about how, uh, how much rail to lay, how, what gauge rail to lay, you know, how far apart the, the, the ties should be, where you're gonna source the engines. And what you really just need to do is buy some Amtrak tickets. So I'm happy to say he actually reached out to us and now instead of $40 million, we have a very small team of Code for America fellows working on this project in sort of a startup way with agile development practices. And they're gonna do it for about one one hundredth of that original cost. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm ahead of myself. Um, so that's a happy story. A slightly less happy story has to do with our engagement with the District of Columbia. When we signed our contract with them, um, Adrian Fenty was the mayor, and a guy uh, who was the CTO working for him was a guy named Brian Sivak. Um, but in, right after we signed our contract, Adrian Fenty lost the election bid, his re-election bid. New mayor came in, fired Brian. A little scary for us, but hey, we had a contract and we had a lot of great contacts in Octo, which is the Office of the Chief Technology Officer. So we sent our three fellows off to their residency month in February in DC. They showed up. They did what everyone does on a first day. They get their badges and they get shown their desks and they get introduced to everybody in the office. They made it till about lunchtime when they were introduced to the general counsel, who took one look at them and escorted them from the building. So they had to call us from here, the National Portrait Gallery. It was February in DC, it was freezing. They ran across the street to the nearest building for our first conference call to tell us that they'd been kicked out. Um, so I said this isn't about politics. Um, unfortunately, sometimes it is about politics and sometimes politics really gets in the way of the good work that people need to do in government. And that was a hard lesson that we've learned. Um, We've also had to learn a little something about culture. Um, so this is Max Ogden, he's one of our fellows. 
He is fantastic and brilliant. He has amazing skills with data and applications. But what he didn't have was a tie. And we didn't really think about that. <laughs> so there are six, uh, six of the team that went to Boston are guys. <clears throat> and it turns out that they had six ties among the six guys. So what they did is they just rotated them every day. And it looked like they each had a new tie each day. <laughs> we trained these guys for a month in January in San Francisco. We trained them on negotiation techniques, on diplomacy, on how to be in a bureaucracy where you're going to be told no a lot and how to move forward, on how city government works. But we forgot to teach them how to dress. But they survived that. There were other smaller um, sort of signs of culture clash. So we tell them when they go into their cities that they're supposed to look for the redundancies and the inefficiencies. And they find that when they're there, for instance, that they're told that they should not be taking notes on their laptops, that they should only have paper out in meetings, and that they should type up the notes later. So this is hard for them, right? <laughs> they're actually becoming part of that system. They've had to work that stuff out. And it's, it's part of our learning to figure out this culture clash. We've also learned um, that it's important to understand what's different about government. So we are trying to bring the approaches from the tech world and from startups into government, but they don't translate directly, and they probably shouldn't. Because when you're doing a tech startup, you're basically trying to make a product that fits a market. Now, if you go in and talk to local government employees, you will hear from them in all sincerity over and over again that they work for everybody, every citizen of that city. It's very hard to make a product that works for everyone right from the start. So this is one of the challenges we have, but I think actually that this is great. This is the values of government being expressed um, in our program, and it's really the challenge that our fellows are going to have to rise to. So we'll see how that goes. One of the things you really need to know about city and state and local government right now is that they're going broke. So many of them have actually gone bankrupt, but you're going to see over the next five to 10 years, many more local governments actually going bankrupt. And many of them, or most of them at this point, to deal with these budget shortfalls are cutting back services to citizens. So when we look at what we can do uh, to help alleviate this situation, we want to build tools and technology that help citizens fill in the gaps where the government can't quite meet our needs. So here's one just quick example of it. It was written in about a day by a different fellow in our Boston team. And it allows citizens of Boston to essentially adopt a fire hydrant. So when it snows a lot in Boston, as it did in February, when we sent our fellows out, um, you know, the, the crews are struggling just to clear the streets. And what, of course, they do is that the, the fire hydrants get covered in these snow banks, and they're essentially inoperable, which is a real safety problem. They're not going to get to them. The crews are not going to get to those fire hydrants, but citizens live right in front of them, and they're digging their cars out. So it's basically a way the citizens can say, don't worry, I've got this one. You go focus on the other ones. And it's a platform for coordination between citizens in the city. Another great example, we didn't write, but this is basically a way that you can sign up and say, I'm CPR trained. If someone is having a heart attack and calls 911 near me, I want to be alerted. I want to go help. So the problems of our healthcare system and ambulance response times, these are very big problems that are very hard to solve. But hooking up two people who are near each other, this is a very easy problem to solve. And we should be solving a lot of these easy problems because it can make a big difference. This can really save a life. The last two questions um, that, I've, that I feel like I've learned have to do with demographics. And the first one is about the demographics of the municipal workforce. So basically, government grew a lot in the 70s. <clears throat> and so you had a lot of young people. About 70% of local government employees were under the age of 40. A lot of those stayed in government. So as of 2006, you had only 13% of local government employees under the age of 40. And moreover, this is for the city of San Francisco. They estimate that up to 60% of local government employees could retire in the next three to four years. So it's going to go from looking like this to looking like that. So who is going to take those jobs? Well, with the budget crisis, a lot of those jobs just aren't going to get filled. So you're going to have people having to come in to local government and have to do incredibly much more with, inc with much, much less. 
And they're not going to be able to do that by cutting here and there within the existing frameworks. What they're going to have to do is take fundamentally new approaches to solving this problem. And to me, that sounds a lot like the disruption that we've seen in a lot of industries over the past 10 or 20 years that's been caused by the internet. So I think we're finally going to have disruption happen in government. And I think what that means is that the people who do rise to this challenge and take these jobs are going to be the next superheroes in the tech world because we really need them. Now, the second lesson that I've learned about demographics takes me back to the beginning of the talk, and it's about our relationship with our government. So we have this story that we tell ourselves about government that says that every successive generation cares less and less and is more and more cynical about government. And this is actually somewhat true. Uh, and this is a study that shows that um, levels of cynicism and dissatisfaction with government are sort of at an all-time high, or a, a many-year high. But that's if you look at the population as a whole. If you break it down by age group, there's a very surprising fact. And that's that millennials, age 13 to 32, uh, 18 to 32, are actually the most pro-government generation in decades. Now, I know there's a lot of millennials here, so if you disagree, you're among the 32% uh, who don't agree that they, we need to have a strong government. Um, but this is very surprising. You don't see something that's trended down for so long as this have and suddenly tick up and not wonder what's going on there. Well, I think there's a lot of things going on, but I think that one of the things is that if you're 20, you've sort of grown up in the Web 2.0 era, which means that you know that things like generating a bunch of ideas and having the best ones bubble up to the top, or collective action or collective intelligence, that these are sort of solved problems. The internet knows how to do these things. Now, if you sort of look at government with a beginner's mind, those are the problems of government. If you take away the bureaucracy and the politics, you're really left with government being, as uh, one of my mentors says, just fundamentally a mechanism for us to do together what we can't do individually. And so those pro-government millennials are not saying that they think government works now. What they're saying is that they think that government can work if it's recrafted in our image the way that we do, uh, and I actually mean millennials, but all of us that work uh, in our personal lives and our professional lives, if we recraft it to work the way, we, the way we do, we think it can work. So I'm not here to say that millennials are going to save us. Um, and I'm not here to say that if you're over 32, you're not part of the solution because I'm about a decade over 32, and I hope that I am. But I will say that being that age, I spent my 20s and my 30s identifying as something called a netizen, which meant that I didn't really have an allegiance to my local community or my city or my state or my country. I felt like I belonged to the communities that the internet had made possible for me. But my hope now is that this term netizen just sounds hopelessly outdated. It sounds sort of square, I think, now. So the terms that mean something to me now are like civic hacker or hacktivist or citizen programmer. And what are those people? These are people who are hacking for government. And I'm not saying, uh, they're not hacking for, to be citizens of the internet. They're really hacking to be citizens of our government. And they're not doing it in protest. They're doing it to actually help this institution work better for everybody. So, this is definitely a cross-generational call to action, um, but I do think the millennials here are telling us something that we should be listening to, and that's that government can work and that it's worth saving. Thank you.